is a time for the doors to be open for those of you who want them to open. It's time for those who have been sitting on your backsides to get up off of them. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind, you know. When Jesus went looking for laborers, he didn't go around looking for the people that were lying around under a tree eating grapes. He went out and looked for them. Now, please listen. Everything I'm going to come out of my mouth tonight, I pray it'll be the Holy Ghost, nothing else. He went out and looked for them, and he hired some then and some in the middle of the day and some at the end of the day, and they all got paid the same, and then the ones that got hired at the end complained, said, well, we, the, in the morning, rather, said, we've been working all day. We didn't, get, we didn't get any more than the others who just started. And Jesus said, so what? I called you, didn't I? Are you listening? You got a chance to enter into the kingdom, didn't you? And I put you to work, didn't I? Why should I pay you any less than the others? Or any more than the others? You were called when it was your time to be called. Get this. Get this. There's no going back to tomorrow. Well, why didn't I get it then? And why didn't I? Forget all that. Yesterday's gone. It isn't coming back. You can glean some things from it, but a lot of things you won't. You've got to realize that this life right now for a Christian is going to become increasingly more requiring. You'll still win, but you're going to have to show God there's more in you than simply buns. It's got to be some beef in there somewhere too. Hmm? People aren't going to be attracted to skinny hamburgers. You know, they'll try to make some way to look at, make it look fatter, make it look bigger. Christianity, you can't make it look fatter. In fact, when you get fat as a Christian, it'll be because you've eaten skinny food. Now listen to what I'm telling you. I'm talking about fat as prospering as a Christian. You're going to, have to be willing to put up with some things you never put up with before. The hamburger company can fake it. The Holy Spirit doesn't fake it. You can pretend you're eating this when you've got that. Or you can pretend to eat that when you've got this. Best thing as a Christian in the times in which we're living in right now is to make adjustments for yourself. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. One of the things we're going to discover today is talk, we, I begin to talk a little bit about the champion of the valley. And this morning, and I'll tell you exactly what time it was, it was 1.37. I woke up and, 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 and I'm thinking to myself, sitting around trying to roll left, right, couldn't sleep. Anybody know what that's like? Yeah. At 2.04, the Holy Spirit started to talk to me about the champion of the valley and how we're going to defeat the champion of the valley. Goliath was the champion of the valley. We'll talk a little bit about him too. But I want you to see what set him aside as a champion of the pagans. It's the same thing that's setting the champions aside today as champions of the valley. And it's the same reason that the ones who defeated him had to be brought into the valley before they could defeat the champion of the valley, which was Goliath. The whole of the army of Israel was standing around, I call it a mountain, I've been there, not a mountain, it's like a hill. But they're all lying around on the sides of the hill. Saul, their boss, was back in the tent, sharpening up his sword and polishing his armor. And in the meantime, God had to look for a man. I said, God had to look for a man. Where were the men hiding in their little churches? Waiting for Sunday for the pastor to make them feel better about themselves? That's not my job. It's not my job. My job is to inspire you to be giant slayers. My job is to prepare you and equip you and get you empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what God has called you to do. Nobody else can do what God has called you to do. You are unique. You are unique. Turn your nerves. I am unique. Yeah, the devil make you feel like you're a loser, a liar, a flop, flip. Whatever he, whatever he tells you, the devil's a liar. If, if the Satan, Jesus said, kills, destroy, and rob, that's his job. That's all he knows how to do. He has no revelation, so he has to learn by inspiration of your knowledge. He has to learn not by revelation, but by information. He gets that information from your big mouth. Everybody's getting a chance to play their part. Yes, the Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, even the Catholic brothers and sisters, they all have a part to play. But at the same time, those who have opened up their heart to a higher level of information and then revelation, which means wisdom. If you're going to seek after anything in these last days, it better be wisdom. Or if you stay stupid, you'll stay broke. If you stay stupid, you'll stay uninformed. You'll stay depressed. You'll stay unable to sleep. You'll stay sick and not recover. Do you hear what I'm saying? All the devil needs is a foot in the door to stop that door closing in his face. 
The only thing that shuts the door is the word of God. Are you listening? In Hebrews it says that the, the word of the Lord is a sharp two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. That uh, the, the, the word of the Lord, excuse me, uh, yeah, the word of the Lord is like a sharp two-edged sword, able to divide the soul from the spirit and, and, and the bone from the marrow and is able to discern the thoughts and intents. Now, you know anybody that can do that? No. <laughs> Only God. The thoughts and intents of the heart. The key to understanding this stuff is that in the last days, the main factor that's going to destroy a lot of Christians walk. Not, you can't remove God from you. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall, shall height or depth or width or persecution or famine? Will any of these things be able to separate you from the agape love of God? The answer is no. But we don't believe that. If we believed that, then nothing would, fear couldn't come in. Then doubt wouldn't be able to come in. Then guilt wouldn't come in. Who's the author of guilt? You say sin. Who's the author of sin? Satan. It's all designed to do one main thing, to kill, to steal, and destroy. Kill, steal, and destroy. And if your faith and hope in God remains intact, it's impossible to steal, kill, and destroy. Remnant of the Most High God. Those who are called to bleed a little, but not too much. You hear what I just said? Yes. Without, the, without, the, without the sacrifice of blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood, life is in the blood. Most of the time for most of us, and those that are out watching over the internet, the life in the blood has great consequences. And I think it's the fear of evil that God said Job fell on his face. It was because of the fear of the, the things that he feared the most. He was concerned they were going to come on his family. But what he didn't realize, and he was the patriarch. So if the fear came on him, it would come on them. And he discovered it right at the very end. He said, the fear of everything that I thought would happen now is seemingly coming to pass. And yet still God said nothing. And right at the very end, it says, and God restored. If we go into the psychiatrist's book, which I'm going to hit in a minute, as the main reason why Christians are going sideways, they're becoming their own gods, and making up their own rules, their own laws, and everything else as they go along. It's true, whether you believe it or not, it is. And I'll prove it to you in just a second. Anyway, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll go there in just a second. But... I discovered for myself that when a man's heart is prepared with tenderness, he can receive a whole lot better. It's like Jesus learned a lot of things about people. He knew a lot about people. And he said, these people, how long have they been following us around, boys? Three days, Lord. Whew, they've got to be hungry. Tell them to find a nice green meadow somewhere that's, that's pretty. And, uh, and have them sit down in groups of 50s or whatever they do. And we'll feed them. Why? Because if you don't feed an empty belly, they're not going to hear anything going into their head. Right? And then it's funny how the crowd sort of separated. And then when Jesus met the next crowd, he said, you're not here because of the spiritual food. You're here because I fed the 5,000. I'd rather have 500 or 50 that would follow me with a heart than 5,000 that would follow me with an empty belly. But because you're hungry, I'll feed you. And then they wandered off. It's, it's, if you read the scriptures, they wander, he fed them and they wandered away. Yeah. And when he first got to the point where he said to Peter, are you going to leave too, Peter? Peter says, where else can I go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And he got excited because Peter was saying, your spiritual manner means more to me now than food in my belly, than finding a handsome boyfriend or a handsome girlfriend. More important to me is I've discovered the will of the Lord. Yeah. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of the God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. Everyone say piercing. Piercing. Even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. Well, I quoted it pretty right, didn't I? And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now that means that this dividing 
requires a very sharp, decisive instrument to separate the two. Now herein lies the problem, and I wrote down exactly what I, what I sensed when I wrote this down. It says, the thing that separates the soul from the spirit has to be the word of God. And what's happening here, if you realize these two words here, separating even the dividing of the soul and the spirit, most of us, our Christians, are taught that we are a triune being, correct? Three parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, inner court, outer court, holy place, I've taught you all those things. But also we are spirit, soul, and we are body. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of revelation here, okay? So I want you to think what I'm saying to you. The part that is connected to God is always the spirit, not the soul. Follow that? There are two separate words in the Greek. One is suke, the other is Greek word pneuma, which is the breath of God. The thing that turned God's creation, Adam, into a living being or a spirit being, because you can't be living without a spirit that is from heaven. The spirit that is in you the day you're born is a spirit which will ultimately cause you to live forever without God because of the sin in the garden. Got that? We know that we were redeemed by the death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ who was God incarnate. God was his father. You know all those things. They're basic things. But I started doing a little bit of study on why people have so much trouble between the suke and the, and the spirit of man, the pneuma, the breath of God. We can receive the breath of God. What happens to the soul? Do we lose it? The emotional separation which takes place cannot kill the soul. It coexists with the soul. Therefore, if God is... Oh, this is going to be good. You're going to love this. If God is going to bring you as a remnant man or woman into a killer of the giants who dwell in the valley... Remember I told you, all the work takes place in the valley. Yes. Matthew 17, I don't know if we even got there, did we? But Matthew 17, if you read that again, it's the story of Jesus being t- taken, uh, James, John, uh, 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 up onto the mountaintop. Yes. Peter, James, and John, up, thank you, Lord, up onto the mountaintop. The, the, the whole idea of the conversion. The conversion process will depend upon what Jesus presented to the disciples in Matthew 17. After he presented himself to him, he read the story, but I want you to read it again, just to remind us of the whole of chapter 17. It's also in Mark 9, I believe. Uh, Peter, James, and John went up to the mountain. What did Peter see? He saw the appearance of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. Saw their spiritual bodies. Saw them physically in their spiritual bodies because they were allowed to be seen. God took the veil away, moved them from one dimension to another. I've told you, when you die, your spirit leaves your body, goes to another dimension. Either that dimension, I point north just because most people think of heaven that way, but it's actually two dimensions. One is filled with the spirits of the departed saved, and the other is filled with the departed spirits that have denied Christ. So that when your spirit body, when your spirit man leaves the body, it forms a, a different form of you identifiable not so much by your appearance because your appearance may change a little. They didn't recognize Jesus on the road to Damascus. Emmaus, sir, Emmaus. And he didn't recognize him, and then he heard Jesus talking. When you leave your body, there's no going back. The time to do something about what you know now and what you learn now is now so that you can do something with what you've learned to help other people. Because I realize that the only way we're going to learn what it's like on the mountaintop is to deserve to be there. The Apostle Paul says, I just hope to God that I'm found worthy to enter into the kingdom. Resurrection, what he talked about. Then we discovered something really interesting about him. He said, the man that I wish I was, I don't always demonstrate. And the ones that are, the one that uh, I I think I've got everything under control and I find out I'm miserable, I fail miserably at it. Who'll deliver me? Thank God, Jesus. Now, what you don't realize is your failures are preparing you to climb the mountain. And through it all, you are meeting the giants who rule the valley. What good are you if Jesus didn't do for you what he did to Peter, James, and John? He said, now, after 
they had a chance to watch Jesus talking to the law and talking to the prophets, Moses and Elijah. They disappeared. What happened? They went back into the other realm. Different dispensation, a different, a different organization of the atoms which make up what we see in touch. A different realm. God, it's so fascinating when you think about it that Jesus could walk through a wall. Why? Because his molecular structure was a finer degree than the structure of the plaster or the brick. It's called quantum physics. It's the ability for two realms to exist, to coexist in the same space without seeing each other. In the coming down of the mountain, first thing that happened, what happens? They bump into a father that's got a demon-possessed boy. From that, God began to speak to me. You're no good to me on the mountain. I've got to take you down where the, where, the, where the giants are, where the demons are, and that's where you're going to have to learn how to handle demons. And the first question the disciples asked then is like most of you guys now, why could not we cast him out? Well, what have you been doing for the last 10 years anyway? When was the last time you cast the devil out of somebody? Well, Jesus is our okay, boys, here's why. And first of all, he said something you've got to get as well as, as members of the remnant. They asked him, why couldn't we cast him out? And they said, this kind cometh not out but by fasting and by prayer. Remember that? But then before that, he says, oh, just bring the boy to me. And he was a bit grumpy. And then Jesus said, you wicked and perverted, twisted generation, or rather, he says, you, you twisted and, and ignorant generation. How long am I going to have to put up with you? And people ask me that question all the time. Who was he talking to, the disciples or to the Father? He was talking to both of them. Because they were both upset, twisted, and misinformed. Because they, the Father said, can you please, if you can do anything, please do something. And it wasn't a matter of not doing it. The fact that the disciples couldn't do it was based on their lack of prayer and preparation because this kind, what kind? This epileptic spirit that was on this kid, on this little boy, was trying to destroy him, a spirit of destruction. Jesus cast the spirit out, the boy was made whole and everybody got, a le everybody got an education. Jesus didn't rebuke them for trying. He didn't even rebuke them for failing. He rebuked them because they didn't prepare themselves. And then that brought disrepute on the father who said, I brought them to your remnant, but they couldn't do anything. And Jesus, yeah, it grieved the, the father's heart. It grieved the Lord's heart. How long am I going to have to put up with a generation that doesn't listen? See? Because his heart is for the saved. All right, now. I've got to move on from that real quick. I want you to think about this one for a second. A couple of scriptures that I want you to do a little studying with. Now, now, Paul, I was thinking this morning early, and I want to give you these points before we quit. Saul, who became Paul, if you remember, Saul was, was, was knocked down off of his horse on the road to Damascus. Who was this Saul? And we know some things about him that are important. And on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 26 9 through 18. Can we rip through that very quickly? And I want to show you what's happening in your life as being converted from people who are churchgoers most of your lives and now you're being confronted with the reality of who is Jesus? Who is he? Who am I? Why aren't I about my father's business? You're not motivated. Why aren't I motivated? You have to answer yourself that question. Acts 26, 9 through 18. I indeed thought I said, verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. Now, here's Paul talking about himself while he was Saul. He said, I did things that were really contrary to Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus even. Next verse, real quick. This I did also in Jerusalem and many of the saints. I shut them up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. He sentenced people to death. Acts 20, he's giving his testimony. Yes. <laughs> anyway, listen to this. He said, um, next verse, verse 11. I punished them often in every synagogue and, and I compelled them to blaspheme. He said, I made them swear and curse so that I could find fault against them. And being exceedingly enraged against them. 
Can you hear that? The anger in him. I was enraged and I persecuted them even to foreign cities. I followed them wherever they ran. What did he do there? Well, obviously, if you read the other accounts, he persecuted them, had them slaughtered, put as many to death as he could find. Then while this occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest to do more hell and damage. Next verse. At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. This is what I mean about the calling of God on you. You can't do these things unless the call of God is on you. I don't care what Bible school you went to. All you're going to attract is the ones Jesus wanted to attract. The downcast, the hurt, the broken, the disconnected, the ones that have been abused. Are you listening? They're the warriors. They will not run from the giants. They will not run from the, from the captains or the champions of the valley because God has trained them not to have a spirit of fear. Poor of the bear, the poor of the lion, same God will deliver me from you, you uncircumcised Philistine. Now you've got to understand the word uncircumcised means exactly what Paul was when he was describing himself many years after the fact. See? And when we'd all fallen to the ground, we just call it about, oh, we went down under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it was, but that's how they described it. I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, <laughs> I love this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's very hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks. And that simply means there was a cattle prod that they used to use to make dumb animals do what they wanted them to do. Cruel, I know, but that's what they did. And so Jesus is saying, I gave you a lot of opportunities to repent and get your heart right, but you didn't. You went to church every synagogue every Sunday, but you didn't go there to worship Jehovah. You went there to persecute the saints. What was the power behind Paul's desire to persecute the saints? It was the suke. He had been trained, and I'll give it to you in a minute. He had been trained by Gamaliel. That's found in, in Acts, uh, uh, nine, uh, Acts 22. Sat under the feet of Gamaliel. Who was Gamaliel? Gamaliel was a Greek philosopher. A Greek, are you all listening? Yes. Are you listening? Yes. This is what's in 90% of the churches today. You better figure this one out for yourself. They are philosophizing and bringing God's children under the bondage of their own choices saying that it's a higher level of wisdom, which is what Gamaliel was the highest paid teacher that you could rent. Paul's family, Saul, were very wealthy. Very wealthy. They, sat him, they would have cost him a lot of money to sit under the feet of this teacher, Gamaliel, who was known throughout the whole of, of Asia Minor. He said, I sat under him. Anyway, if you read on further down here, verse 18, if you go through this, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus telling him, there's your ministry. There's your ministry. Now, from now on, he said, your eyes are going to be blackened, so you can't see anything that's going to turn you off, hear anything that's going to be against me. I'm going to put you in intensive training. 17 years! And he said, my only sign, the fact that I've honoured God are the stripes on my back. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. No? But he was, he was, had to learn how to be disobedient to his earthly vision. Gamaliel taught him all the principles of psychological warfare. And they had brainwashed this Saul and perverted him away from what God's calling was as a latter-day remnant apostle. What turned him away? His education. God had to take away and re renew his education regarding the things of divine nature. Where did he get that? In the valley and in the wilderness. Where did God pass his final test? In the wilderness. David, in the wilderness. You'll find this, listen to this. David in the wilderness, in chapter 17, verse 28, and chapter 23, verse 14, everything that happened to young David before he became king, he was trained in the wilderness. Are you listening? Until we get to this, and I've got to hit this because it's awesome. I think it's awesome. In 1 Samuel 17, let's go there real quick. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together in a battle and were gathered at Sohar, which belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Sohar and Ezekiel in Ephes Damin, which is the wilderness, a valley in the wilderness. Next verse, come on. 
And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. Okay, we know all this story, but we'll move it anyway real quick. The Philistines stood on a mountain. <laughs> now, what did I tell you? What did I teach you last week about the valley and the mountaintop? You learn in the valley, you are rewarded in the mountaintop. So the Philistines stood on a mountainside. Now, I taught this, some visitors haven't heard this before. The mountaintop is where Jesus was in Matthew 17. Jesus went up the mountain, then he came down the mountain. And where was all of his ministry taking place? In the valley. Right? Where do we spend eternity? No, on the mountaintop. We don't spend it in the valley. Your valley time is done. Once you've left this body, you're done, chickadee. There's no more else to be used. You can't be used for anything else when your mouth shuts, your breath leaves your body, and the Lord hopefully carries you into his bosom. That's only going to happen for those of you that know God. And it'll happen within three seconds of you breathing out your last breath. The Philistines stood on the mountain, one on one side and Israel on the other. So here was a valley in which the decision will be made as to who rules. You listening? All right. We are at that place now, 2020. It's the rise of the remnant. You're, in a, you're not on the mountaintop yet. You won't be there until you die. Forget the mountain. Forget it. If you go there, it'll be in a rapture or when you're praising the Lord or you'll get touched with the anointing. Awesome. Most of the time down in the stinky valley because the valley is where the, the, the aggressors lived. That's where the plains were that they plowed up and grew their grapes and all that stuff, right? That, that's, the land that flowed with milk and honey doesn't happen on mountaintops. So they're caught in a valley here. Next verse, real quick. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He was a big, ugly dude. Now, if we go on further, skip on down three or four verses. He stood and cried out, this is God, stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Why'd you even bother? We rule and reign here. You pretend to rule and reign because of your God, Jehovah. But we're on the same levels as you are. He says, have you come out to line up? For battle? I'm not a Philistine and you are, excuse me, I am not a Philistine and you are the servants of Saul. Therefore, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Let him come down to me. He wasn't up to begin with. They're both on the same level. He, what he's doing here is a psychological stuff. This Goliath had five brothers, four brothers. This Goliath had been trained in psychological warfare. Now here's something you're going to learn. Are you listening? Yes. Are you listening? Yes. Goliath of Gath, his power was derived from his psychological strengthening. And if you read the whole thing, and I wish I had time, but I don't, to preach it to you. He was raised up as a young boy to be in battle. He was serviced as a young boy to learn the art of warfare and hand-to-hand -hand combat. But there was something else that set him aside. It describes his spear, huge. He was like seven foot tall. He was a huge, huge, ugly man, right? And when I read that, the Holy Spirit said to me, the strength of a person who is psychologically empowered not spiritually empowered, psychologically powered must also be impressive physically. His desire will be to stand out because of his physical presence. The, now a lot of people are going to knock me for this, but I'll tell you. The Apostle Paul said, physical exercise profiteth little. A little. Why the big attraction to working out today? When that working out, there's nothing wrong with working out, you won't work out, that's fine. But the priority ought to be spiritually worked out. As a man or woman of God, you have more power in your life and in your words than Arnold Schwarzenegger ever had. Philistine said, I, am I a dog that you sent a boy? Look at me. See, I'm going to have your head. And David, who was not trained physically, he was just a boy in his early teens. Are you listening? Where did he get his training? I could preach a whole sermon on this. Where did he get his training, my brothers and sisters? He got it in the wilderness. And if we read the, in the story here, when his father sent him to feed his brothers, the brothers had nothing but disdain for him. Why did you come here, you troublemaker? They said, read it. 
Why did you, why did you come here just to stir trouble? He said, I, 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 what have I done? Right? And then he said, what's that noise? Who's that yelling? And they said, nothing to do with you, kid. Go home. But his father had already packed him some cheese for the, for the, for the, for the, for the head commanders and special food for the sons. And he, he handed off the food and then he asked her, what is that bellowing? He said, this is, this is Goliath, the champion. See, the champions. And, and, they said, and he said, uh, well, uh, what? okay. Uh, what does the guy get? That knocks this guy off. No fear. He saw him, he heard him. He said, oh, you get to marry Saul's daughter. What's she look like? <laughs> he said, the whole mentality of this kid And they ask him, what qualifies you to be here? He said, the same God that delivered me from the poor of the bear. And where were you when the poor of the bear came? Where were you when the poor of the lion came? I'll tell you where I was, walking around getting my feet covered in sheep doo-doo. That's where I was, playing songs to God at night time, where the spirit of the living God came upon me and has anointed me to be his champion. And he said, today I'm here to take the head of their champion and put the crown on my head. Now, if you read the story, the whole battle here took place in the valley, but while it was finished, the tribe of Judah and the champions who were supposed to be the champions of Israel, they had taken the high place and the Philistines were disrupted, disorganized and lost their champion. And that day, God's people took the place, spiritually speaking, of the high ground. And it's time for you to pick up on this and and excite yourselves with the passion that still burns in some of us when it comes to our salvation. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved other than by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is anointing and prophesying over his champions. And it's time for you to rise up and take on your responsibility as those who defeat the giants of the Philistines and take the crown of victory on your head on behalf of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.